I turn now to the third question. Here it comes. Are there any theories that suggest that a mind could extend beyond the body? Does quantum theory have anything to suggest about this? Well, there too we have two questions. Uh, the first is, uh, uh, is, are there any theories that suggest a mind could extend beyond the body? Indeed, there are such theories. There are, for uh, starters, there, there is the general philosophical position of panpsychism. Uh, a panpsychist position states that mind is everywhere, that everything has a mind. The problem uh, from a scientific point of view um, is how do you know whether something has a mind or not? How do you go about determining whether or not something has a mind? And before you can do that, you have to define what you mean by mind. And there we are in the meat and veg of this course. That's what we're, these are the central issues that we're grappling with in this course. What do we mean by a mind? How do we go about determining whether or not something has a mind? Um, I've said that there's a philosophical position, which is the panpsychist position. There are also specific theories. Um, there is the well-known discipline of artificial intelligence, part of the computer sciences, um, where the question has frequently been asked, um, do these non-biological intelligent machines, do they have minds? Um, and there's the famous Turing test, which is uh, a systematic method for determining whether or not a intelligent machine has a mind. I'm going to be discussing um, uh, these issues uh, in the lessons to follow, so I won't go down that path any further now. But I will state my own position um, uh, 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 in, in the sort of simple, concrete way in response to this question. This, because we can only know our own minds, each one of us, the only empirical evidence, the only way you can ever observe a mind is to observe your own. So our starting point empirically for whether or not something has a mind has to be ourselves. Then we can look to other members of our species, if they've got bodies just like us and behave just like us ourselves, then there is, by the ordinary scientific method, every reason to hypothesize that they too have minds, and you can test that hypothesis by making predictions uh, about whether they would behave in certain circumstances in the same way as you would behave from the, uh, by virtue of the fact that you have a mind. Then you can start tr trying to identify what is it about the human brain that gives us these shared capacities. Which parts of the brain produce these functions that we call mental? Then you can look to other creatures and see which other creatures have those same anatomies and physiologies. And then you can make hypotheses and predictions about them uh, in just the same way as I spoke earlier about us humans. That approach seems to me a perfectly reasonable, sensible, scientific approach to the question uh, as to uh, whether or not another object, uh, an object other than ourselves, our subject, uh, is, uh, whether, whether or not another object has a mind. I don't think you can use that approach with computers, uh, or for that matter with carpets or stones. Uh, the, 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 the anatomy and physiology that we know exists in us, that is the part of the, 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 the body, the human body, and as it turns out the mammalian body and the vertebrate body, uh, the, those parts of the brain which we share with these other creatures give us a good basis for assuming that they too have minds, and we can test our, our, our hypotheses in this respect uh, by um, seeing whether or not our predictions are confirmed. We can't do that with these, other, with these other objects because they don't have that anatomy and physiology. We can't probe it in the way we can us, ourselves. However, there doesn't seem to... We, so we can't, we can't... We don't have a good basis for assuming they have minds, but that doesn't mean that we can't... That doesn't mean that we could ever claim in any absolute sense that they definitely don't. Uh, so I myself am very skeptical about any non-biological creature having a mind because there's no evidence to suggest that it does. There's no way of testing it. We, you're then turning, it, you're turning the question into, into something that goes beyond the realms of science, like, is there an afterlife? Does God exist? We can't do experiments on, on these questions. Um, and so we have to admit our ignorance. We have to accept, uh, we have to show some humility in regard to 
questions which are beyond our capacity to answer scientifically. Um, but the, the uh, questioner here goes on to say, does quantum theory have anything to say about this? And uh, of course, the questioner has something in mind and obviously knows that, yes, indeed, quantum theory has something to say about this. Um, uh, there are great uh, many um, people working in that area, um, but in a nutshell, um, the view is uh, th there are two aspects to it. The one is that there are uh, uh, properties at the quantum level, um, which uh, uncertainty at the quantum level, which is shared, which are properties shared with um, consciousness, and then uh, the the uncertainty principle also invokes the need for an observing uh, a, 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 a being uh, to be able to decide uh, these, these questions of uncertainty. And this has led to various schools of thought. Uh, perhaps the best known uh, um, uh, theorists in this area are Roger Penrose and Stuart Hameroff. Um, so yes, quantum physics has something to say about this. It takes a view that there is a property at the quantum level um, which, uh, which may be another fun fundamental property of nature, a fundamental physical property of nature, which is, this, uh, which is this thing that we call mind or that we call consciousness. They tend to equate the two things, the theorists in question. I think that the, that the, the, the that, that proposition is very interesting, but it comes in different varieties. You know, on the one hand, you can say it's a property of nature, it's a property of all, of all matter, uh, everything has a quantum level of description. But some of them speak in a narrower sense of quantum level processes in the neuron. So uh, they're not, everything in the universe is made of the same matter. Uh, but then there's biological matter, which is different from inorganic matter. And then there are different types of biological matter. There's specific tissues, which are neural tissues made of nerve cells of neurons. And there are quantum level explanations of the processes going on inside the neuron, which then reduces um, the theories in question. Uh, it, uh, it, no longer, it no longer takes into account what the question here is, um, is asking, which is, if these quantum level events happen outside of biological bodies, then can't we speak of minds outside of biological bodies? Well, yes, in theory we can, uh, but uh, uh, it may be that the specific organization of those, of those events in the molecular structures known as neurons, uh, that it's only there um, where the biological level of consequence occurs, um, even if ultimately the causal explanatory framework is a quantum one. These are very general statements in relation to a very big area. I'm sorry, there's no way in which one can address it um, uh, uh, less verbosely than this. But I want to end with my own view on this matter, which is that I do agree that uncertainty is an important feature of consciousness. Uh, this is not something that we're going to address in this course. Um, I, I will just say I wrote a paper on this topic in the Journal of Integrative Neuroscience in 2014, uh, a neuropsychoanalytical perspective on the hard problem of consciousness is the, is the title of the paper. And there I argue that if you look at neural processes, uh, that is to say the brain, from a subjective point of view, uh, that is from a mental point of view, uh, it seems as if a, an important basic property of consciousness has to do with inability to, make, inability to make a definite prediction. You look at that same process from the outside, from the objective point of view, and you see the neural processes, it seems that the correlate, the physical correlate for consciousness uh, is the labile state of the neural networks and, and even the, a labile state of, of the individual neuron. So. I won't go into more detail about this, a very complex issue, and as I say, it goes beyond uh, the scope of uh, this course. Uh, I would refer you to that paper of mine, uh, but I'm wanting to make this point, that uncertainty, the uncertainty referred to by the quantum physicists and quantum uh, consciousness theorists, I think that that same concept can be invoked uh, without reference necessarily to quantum mechanics that the, uns the, the, the lability the un uh, 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 in the neuron when it is not in a s state of a fixed memory 
um, uh, algorithm, that the, 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 the way that the neuron fires becomes unpredictable, perhaps correlating with something like decomposition of PKM zeta, which is at the molecular level in the neuron, nothing to do with quantum mechanics, uh, correlates with the mental process of not having a fixed automatized program for how one deals with this thing, but rather having to bring consciousness to bear on the problem because of the uncertainty. Um, I think that that psychophysical correlation, the physiological process in the cell, the mental process um, in, the, in the person, uh, that these things can be correlated with each other uh, and, and do seem to point to something fundamental about how consciousness works, but it doesn't necessarily have to do with quantum mechanic levels of explanation.